everybody, and welcome to a new episode of Design Cinema. This is Feng Zhu speaking, and we are back after a two, three, what, maybe three week delay. Sorry, sorry about that. We have some new projects coming in, so the art department has been quite busy getting those uh, ramped up. So let's continue. So this episode will be the last part of the storyboard, storyboard series. Uh, after this, we'll be moving into another series, which should be quite cool. We've been spending a couple of weeks preparing for that, and we have a lot of content to share with you guys uh, in the next episode, which is not storyboarding anymore. So today, let's just jump right in real quick. Uh, today, what we're doing is showing you guys another use of storyboarding. So last week, we mentioned storyboards could be used for planning your green screen, your camera moves, your difficult shots, and also some after use and when to use your leads versus... Uh, uh, without with body doubles, for example. So, but there are many, many uses for storyboarding. And the things I'm sharing with you guys is exactly what we do in the real studio. So we don't I mean I'm not recording anything that's just for the sake of just doing design cinema. This is what we use every day in the studio. So what you see here are a couple of boards that I extracted from the series of boards that we've done. This is very typical in the beginning stages of a film. So storyboarding does the storytelling, right? The green screen has planning with VFX companies and so forth. Now we're doing this sequence in which we're going to try to show the mood and the lighting and the color and the styling of this film. Because from this, directors could understand this, right? They could see this go, okay, cool, this is how the story goes. But imagine you want to now green light this film or show potential producer, ex executive producers, studio heads, CEOs, right? Uh, basically individuals who are not designer based or creatively based. Uh, for example, investor types and so forth. So it's very important to get this film to look like what it could look like when it's done. So less creative people, for example, could see the final result. Now, directors and so forth could also, of course, benefit from these, but they need a little bit less convincing because as you guys who will watch, you have the image in your head already. But to describe that to someone without going through a painting is very difficult. So what we do in the early stages to prepare uh, you know, these kind of showcases is to do a series of paintings. On a real film, you might end up with about, i say anywhere from 20 to 40 paintings. That's generally typical before the film is generally green. Now I'm talking about films that are very, very big budget and very VFX heavy. The reason why we do them, uh, I probably mentioned many times in my design cinema series, but the reason why we do them is because these films are so expensive that the studio needs to be convinced that the direction and the look and feel of the film is what they want to fund, essentially. Because if you show them storyboards like these and a script, it's very tricky for them to green light a film that costs 100 or 200 million dollars, right? They need to see some pre-production stuff. And these are almost pre-pre-production. It's not even production. Uh, pre-production stuff, it's pre-pre. That means the design's not really there, the casting is not really done yet, uh, we're not even exactly sure what the budget is, but there's a vision. There's a vision for the film. So the art department goes in and do a series of paintings to convince everybody else that this vision is what everybody wants to uh, to jump on board. So what I've done here, obviously, is to only choose three, but typically we'll choose a lot more than just three. Maybe 20, 35, something, somewhere around there is a good number to kind of describe the entire film. So say you have a 90-minute film and you take two shots every 10 minutes, they end up with about 18, uh, 18 frames, right? If I did my math correct. So here, since we have a very short sequence, I only chose three. And what we try to do is choose three shots that give you an overall feel of the entire project. So in this case, it's only a two minute trailer. So we chose three shots. So here I chose the establishing shot of Hollywood. I chose a street of the, uh, of Hollywood, right? So that gives us two different views. And then we chose a close up, the hero car, as well as the zombie getting shot. So again, if this is a real project with a lot more boards, I'll be showing the hero, his clothing, his house, and so forth. The, basically the entire story arc. So for the, uh, for the legend one, I chose the establishing shot of the forest, which is quite important, I think. And then the unicorn, which is a major selling point for this uh, trailer. And then a establishing shot of this forest with the little goblins climbing up. So all these, so you can see the here's are my rough. These are done by Yoga, our storyboard artist. Uh, all the paintings I'll be showing you guys are not done by myself. They're done by the art department. So this is, again, the same flow that we use in the real world. So let me open up the legend ones first. And that will be boom, 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 these three here. Okay, so let's take a quick look. So here's the Hollywood. Now I notice it's not exactly the same, and it's okay. It doesn't have to be exactly the boards. The boards is a suggestive 
framing for what we ultimately do. Just like the film is not going to be exactly like this, but it's going to have a very similar feel. So when I hand this off to, in, th in this particular case, this is a designer named Min. He's helping me produce these. So these are my art department um, uh, designers, right? So we took some extra time off to uh, make these episodes. So these are the same uh, uh, designers I work with on a daily basis for other projects. So here's the establishing shot of Hollywood. So let's go to full screen here so you guys can take a look. So what we want to hear is to really get that old uh, Hollywood feel. No tall buildings yet, no massive uh, uh, you know, infrastructures and so forth. Now in the 60s and 70s, a lot of tall buildings were up, but one of suburbia uh, Los Angeles. So got rid of all the shopping centers and big malls and so forth and just filled it out with a lot, a lot of little houses and so forth. And things are a little bit overgrown. So here's the uh, 1969 steam race driving home here. So a little overgrown because no one has taken care of this place in a long time, right? There's no gardeners and there's nobody. So a lot more green than we generally uh, have in the real life here. So again, the purpose of this is to convince the everyone on the team what this film could possibly look like and if this is a, uh, for example, the real shot, how much work, work it would take to realize this film. All right, so let's go to the next one here. So next one is the street shot, which is over here, right? So this is done by Charles here. So this is a different lighting. And I often do that with my designers is that I don't restrict them on the first passes because if you restrict your designers, then you're restricting basically the creativity in the beginning. The most creative part of these projects is in the beginning. You want to leverage your designer's ideas. You don't want to stop them at the first thing, right? So I kind of just let them go free. So go, here's the storyboard. Uh, obviously, they cannot go off cue and make this into a sci-fi project where light is so it's all crazy, right? It still has to be in the styling of this uh, project or this film, but I let them take on the color palette, the overall look and feel. Lahans, it's within the scope of this IP. It's okay to try it. If it goes wrong, it's okay. We have time to fix it. We have time to go to a, for example, direction that we all agree with. But at the beginning, I tend to uh, let the designers run however direction they want. So you can see it's still Los Angeles, obviously the palm trees and so forth, but a little bit different in terms of the color tone. This is Charles's take on a sunset of Los Angeles. This is Min's take on a sunset of Los Angeles, a little bit different color palette. And this is a totally fine. This is very typical on projects in which just different designers will see the film slightly different in their heads. And that's perfect because that opens up a dialogue for the directors and producers to kind of discuss, hey, we want to go with this color palette or with this one, right? But keep in mind, these are pre-pre-production. So uh, just to explain that a little bit here, pre-pre-production is generally done before the film is greened. Okay, so in Hollywood, a lot of these films sit in a, uh, uh, in a limbo state, basically, for anywhere from a few months to years, essentially, before the studio wants to pull the trigger on it and make it into the real deal and pull in, you know, 200 million bucks. So they send this limbo, they hire designers, and they do this pre-pre-production. So the reason why I like to call that is because once you go into pre-production, then the film is generally funded. Your salary comes from the big studios. So versus in pre-pre-production, generally your salary might be coming from the director's studio uh, itself. So you see your paycheck and it's coming from, say, Bay Films or Light, uh, Lightstorm or something, right? But once the film is green and it goes union or it goes into the Hollywood system, then you're getting paid from the uh, film studio who's actually funded it. So anyway, it's a little bit of technicality there, but it uh, hopefully explains. Now I'm speaking really fast again, so let me uh, take a sip of coffee here. The reason is because I have a meeting coming up in about 25 minutes. So I'm trying to wrap this up as quick as I can here. So uh, yeah, uh, this is not, you know, I'm not a YouTuber. I don't do this full time. So uh, I try to find an hour, two hour here and I try to record these for you guys. Okay, let's move on to, let's take a look at this one real quick, full screen, let's zoom in. So let's. So here's our Stingray Corvette. So again, we have to follow story. Put the Hollywood sign here to tell story. So. Is this technically correct in terms of exactly where the Hollywood sign is on the mount? No, it doesn't matter at this case right now. Once we get into pre-production, we can make sure that everything is absolutely correct if that's what the director wants to do. Sometimes it doesn't matter. Film watchers are not the uh, that technical, for example, right? If you move the sign a little bit here and there, it's generally okay because the key of these films is to tell story. It's not to be absolutely correct. So in the early stages here, the whole thing is to sound palm trees, Hollywood sign, Corvette, abandoned street, right? That's what I need to do to tell a story. So uh, I don't really worry if you could get these, this exact shot from Los Angeles. Okay, so here's a Corvette like uh, screeching in, right? And that's from this frame uh, that we see uh, here. So similar frame here. So this car here, this Corvette is rolling in here. 
Ooh. right? Uh, doing a little bit of drifting and all these old classic cars are all abandoned and all the wheels are gone. So we see the same shot here with some classic cars. Uh, we paid attention to detail though. So for example, like the license plates here are California from the 60s and 70s. So these are things that are quite important that we don't want a uh, out of state plate or something like that. We want to tell stories. So Hollywood sign, California plates, and so forth. Um, so these cars are overgrown. So you can see California plates on here as well. So, but we did change out the numbers just in case it's a real number. So we uh, photoshopped out the, whatever the original numbers were. So that's this one, some cactus, right? Classic California homes, very, uh, if you live there, very Pasadena, you know, these kind of homes. Okay, let's go to the third one here, which is the keyframe from here, which is the hero shooting the uh, vampire through the front windshield. I thought this would be a good beat for the film, and here is Min's take on that. So the only thing here, the lights probably should have been off, but although it's on, it's okay as well. So you see the bang action shot, and we have this uh, vampire dude flying in the air, and a couple of vampires getting ready to attack. So this will be the kickoff point for a big action sequence that I didn't board because it would be very time consuming to do that, but this will definitely be the kickoff for that sequence. So uh, quite a bit of action, all sorts of stuff happening. Uh, also palm trees, a little bit of wind blowing to get that chaotic stuff going here. So love this frame, looks really, really cool. So let's take a look at these frames one more time uh, and then we'll move on to uh, Legend. So let's go to the establishing shot here. So what we generally do in the studio is that we do a series of these, you know, a few few weeks to do, uh, produce them, and then we put it all on the walls, and then directors, producers, and so forth, they come in, and you're, you guys are seeing exactly what they will see, which is a series of these kind of paintings to sell the visual look of the film. So they, they could look at it and go, wow, this is, uh, this is what we want to do, or, oh, this is all wrong, this all sucks, let's try again, right? So it doesn't matter. Like I mentioned many times, in the beginning stages, if something goes wrong or it doesn't look fine or the styling is off and the creative people don't agree, that's totally fine that's part of the process you can't do this painting and directors like yeah this is the one we want to go right maybe they're like no we want this complete completely desaturated you know we want this film to look like this right uh, maybe like that like this right? that's fine you know this, this is how these paintings get started without these you have no discussion point you only have some storyboards and some script it's very hard to discuss what you want the film to actually look like so that let's go to our what's our car one here right it's car squeaking Pretty cool shot. I love this very Los Angeles uh, feel over here. And then our last shot here with the zombie. Bam. I should switch to a red pen when I'm making these notes. Okay. Bah, right. Okay. So that's that. And let's take a look at Legends. So let's close that one. How are we doing on time? So as I mentioned, I got a meeting coming up pretty soon. Okay. So let's open up Legends. So the three frames I chose, which we mentioned here. So let's open these up. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. Okay, let's take a look at these in the water they come in. So here's our first frame here with a little deer looking through at something below them and we have this magical forest, right? So very different than I am legend. So now we're moving into a fantasy world here. So the forest is not exactly real. So I had men go in here and make the trees a lot more fantastic than or fantastic goal uh, than a real forest would be. So something like this will be created in the art department. So like something like Weta Workshop or something will build these or will actually um, you know CG these or something like that. But they're not meant to be real. The idea here is for the audience to get a sense that this forest is kind of magical. So we also have a lot of um, uh, stage lighting. So a real forest at nighttime would just be pitch black. Even if you have a moon out, you'll see nothing. So this is all film lighting where you get these key uh, key lighting, hot, hot spots and so forth, create it all in the studio. And that's what this film will try to do as well. So again, this is my take. Like if I was doing this film, this is how I want to look. But you never know, a director might look at this, go, oh no, this is overlit. I want this to look completely realistic. I want this completely to be dark, right? And that's fine. Well, we could even adjust this one to be like that. But again, it gets the conversation going. So a producer could be like, oh, these trees, I don't want to look like that. We're going to film this for reals and, uh, you know, I'm going to shoot it in some forest in Europe, right? And we don't have these trees, for example. So we might change that as well. So this is the first frame. I love this shot. Really cool. So deers are looking at something. Now kind of checking something out. Uh, some mushrooms growing, got a stream going. So very tranquil, very magical what the script was described. Okay, let's look at the next shot here, which is the unicorn. So Min took two uh, takes on it. So I actually like, I think this was his first 
take, and then this is his second take. So I like them both. So uh, we're showing them both to you guys as well. Let's look at the uh, first one here. So again, a lot of theatrical lighting, in which is a lot more colorful than the uh, a real forest would be. So we have the horse here. So we haven't spent time designing it, and that's something that pre-pre-production paintings are very difficult to do because you're in a catch-22 situation. What I mean by that is that you have the script and you have all these designs, but you're asked to do a painting, yet the designs don't exist yet. But that's very typical, the kind of work we take on, and it's very tricky because you're like, I don't even know what this unicorn looks like, right? And in this case, it's not that hard because it's a unicorn, which is a horse. You can't stray away from that too far. But say you get onto a, um, you know, like say Transformers or something. In the beginning, we have to do these production paintings and we didn't even know what the robots look like. But yet you have to make it up on the spot and it has to look kind of cool. So there, you got to spend a few hours to pre-design these things before you even do the pre-pre-production paintings. So it definitely adds a lot of stress in terms of the workload because you got to think about design and then think about storytelling and think about matching it to the film all in a very short amount of time. So once pre-pre-production is done, during your pre-production, then you go back and for example, in this case, this is a pretty um, standard unicorn look, right? This is something we might want to tweak, right? We might sit with the director and go, let's try our unicorn to be a little different. Maybe we have some feathers going down his mane. Uh, maybe this uh, horn is not your typical straight arrow type of horn. Maybe it's something like an antler, which I drew in the storyboards, right? So these are decisions we do once we enter pre-production. But during the this phase of the production, we kind of just have to get everything in there to feel correct. And that's generally what I do as an art director, which is get the feeling to go okay. We can always go back and tweak the design. So in this case, I want the trees to be fantasy. I want to make sure that low birds are always there so it looks very peaceful, very friendly. We want the magical dust flying everywhere and just have a very fantasy feel. So it's not a realistic world. This is definitely leaning towards more, say, Harry Potter. Um, the line, the witch, what, what is it called? The, uh, the, the line, the witch, right? In the wardrobe, whatever. That film, right? We're leaning towards that direction. Okay, let's take a look at the uh, the uh, other film here, the other frame here. So another unicorn shot. Why, why is it not doing keyframe? Okay, here we go. So I like this shot as well. A lot more quiet than the other one. So uh, we have the unicorn here and same thing. So here, men made the horse a little bit more buff than the other one. So a little bit different take uh, and a much thicker horn. So it's, it's a lot more uh, girthy version of the unicorn compared to... Uh, this one here. So, and then we still have the little white birds flying around, these doves to signal peace. And uh, right, that's what this horse represents, what unicorn <laughs> represents in this IP, which is the symbol of uh, peace and good and so forth. And the devil character was trying to kill it. So also magical forest, we have this, I love the stuff that's happening back here with the uh, steams and so forth going through the river. Beautiful shot here with all these little sparkles, right? And you can see how important these frames are to convince people what this film could look like. So they play a major, major part in these big, heavy VFX films. So again, everything I do in design cinema, by the way, is geared towards a very specific part of the industry. This doesn't apply if you're working on a love drama or a crime mystery, maybe a little bit of a crime mystery, but in generally, companies like ours don't get involved. Uh, like I mentioned in the beginning of this, uh, episode, we've been quite busy, right, working on other films, and these films are all big VFX heavy things. Uh, companies that do dramas and so forth don't come to us. They don't. There's no need for companies like ours. They don't need to do this kind of stuff. You could do that probably just off some photos on the internet to kind of get the look and feel. It should be okay, you know. It's like you want a street in New York, you just go find a picture of New York and say that's the look we want. So, but for things that don't exist, you have to go through these pre-production paintings to convince people what it could possibly look like. So yeah, there's some beautiful stuff going on here. So last frame here is the zombies, uh, not zombies, they look like zombies here. The goblins uh, marching up the hill, the establishing shot. So we have some of these nasty looking uh, characters here walking towards a very magical forest. So uh, we, got, we bring in some of the lighting that we had on the unicorn piece to signal the good that's here. And then we have the bad that's kind of going this way, right? So um, yeah, pretty cool shot, little little things flying in. So kind of this, these are going that way and these guys are going that way. So a little bit of a intersection, inter is it? I guess it'll be intersection or conflict between good and bad that's about to happen where these guys are coming in and this is going out. So a lot of compositional flows here as well in terms of composition. So yeah, let's take a look at these one more time. So uh, where's our first frame here? Here is our deer frame. Oh, Photoshop is tweaking out here. 
what's going on here? Too many things open. Here we go. All right. So here's our deer. Oh, look at that. This is a bug in Photoshop. Okay. So uh, the deer is looking with beautiful rays of light coming through. Um, I'm not going to talk about these paintings too much in terms of technicality behind it. This is more of a showcase of how storyboards are used to enhance or to guide these early pre-production paintings, right? So, uh, so I'll leave this frame here for a few seconds and let's move on to the next one here, which is our unicorn in the lot more bright lit uh, scenario here. So I'm bringing in some colors, right? And uh, these are art directions that I've given men here to do this painting as well. So I wanted to kick off some light that's not exactly realistic. Is that, look at this level of greens and blues and so forth. In the nighttime scene, all this stuff will, will be gone. But we also want to kind of hint that this unicorn could give off its own lighting. It, it's a source of light that's giving the colors back to these plants and flowers that otherwise you would not get at a nighttime scene. So it'd be pretty difficult to pull this off, I think, in the CG realm, but these are things that we have tests for, right? So if you get, say, I01 on board, they could do some CG tests for you to see, like, can this look good? If not, then we have to go through different directions. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a talking point, it's a starting point. So let's look at the next one here. Here's this unicorn here. So I'll probably put these up uh, somewhere on on the internet somewhere so you guys can take a look at these uh, yourself as well after this episode it has been aired. Okay, so here's the nighttime unicorn. So love this shot, looks really, really nice. I love all the crazy looking uh, fantasy old uh, forest trees here. So I kind of like this unicorn, but yeah, ultimately we'll make some decisions on it. Maybe we'll have some feathers, I think would be kind of cool. Who knows, but uh, it's pretty cool. <clears throat> Beautiful shot here. Okay, and our last shot is of our goblins climbing up the mountain red to do some bad stuff. Okay, so you can see with these things on the walls, with storyboard reels cut, with the uh, script printed out, you are at a very good position to start showing, showcasing this film to other people. And uh, again, this is exactly what we do in the real world. We are doing that right now for two films. So we just entered pre-pre-production for one of them. We're about to start for another one. And uh, they're very difficult to do. In the beginning, you spend about a week, week and a half just messing around trying to find the direction of these films. And once you get that, get that feel right. Then we start kicking the full on production, just pump these paintings out. And then we bring in everybody, you know, you fly the directors in and you fly the execs in and then blah, blah, blah. Everyone kind of gets involved. Uh, and then hopefully they like it. And then the film goes into production and uh, then it gets to become like a thousand man team. So uh, not, not my company, but the everyone who gets involved. Okay guys, so I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I know it's a short one, but uh, we had a lot of fun making this. So I gotta thank my designers, Min, Charles, Yoga, everyone involved and Sandan, of course, for editing the videos to put all this together for you. But uh, we have a very exciting episode coming up next, which is no more storyboards. We're going to move into a completely different topic, and that will also be a multi-episode uh, series. So I will see you guys uh, on the next one. Okay, this is Fain Zhu signing out. Thank you. Bye-bye.